Hi everyone, we're talking about the bacteria Bacillus cereus and its associated food poisoning condition, which is known as reheated rice syndrome. So Bacillus cereus is going to cause food poisoning and it leads to gastrointestinal and systemic manifestations. We're going to talk about those when we talk about the signs and symptoms later. Now the bacteria Bacillus cereus is a gram-positive rod. It's facultatively anaerobic, meaning that it can operate when there's oxygen present, but if there's no oxygen present, it can still operate and switch to fermentation. It is toxin producing and spore forming. These are going to be important when we talk about the pathophysiology behind how this leads to infection. It's also catalase positive and a motile bacteria, so it can move around on its own. Now this bacteria is found globally and food poisoning caused by Bacillus cereus is relatively common. It's estimated to affect at least 60,000 people annually in the United States. And as mentioned before, this occurs worldwide and it's likely that this is underreported. Many people probably get food poisoning from Bacillus cereus and don't even know it. So now let's talk about how people can get infected with Bacillus cereus. So some important facts to make note of with regards to this bacteria is that it can multiply rapidly at room temperature and even in mildly heated environments. So if you were to leave food out at room temperature, the bacteria, if there is any or any spores, it can rapidly multiply. And this is especially true if it's left in room temperature greater than two hours. Now, what's also important is that the spores that the bacteria can produce can survive high temperatures for long periods of time. And this bacteria can be found both in soil and in food products. So food products are where we're mostly going to get infected by this bacteria. Some of the contaminated food products can include the following. Rice, vegetables, beans, beef, and turkey, and also potatoes, pasta, and cheese. Now there are actually two forms of infection with Bacillus cereus. One of them is known as the emetic type or the emetic form, meaning that it's a vomiting type. You're more likely to have vomiting from an infection. And this is most likely going to occur if you were to eat contaminated rice. And in some instances, it's been noted to also occur if you were to eat contaminated potatoes, pasta, or cheese. Whereas the second form of this infection is the diarrheal form. And this is mostly going to occur from eating contaminated meat products like beef and turkey. We'll talk about this in more detail in the next upcoming slides. So because we can get Bacillus cereus in soil and in food products, there's actually a couple of different ways we can get infected by this bacteria. And one of them, and the most common way we're going to get infected by this bacteria is by eating contaminated food. And the other way is through direct inoculation into a wound. We talked about the fact that Bacillus cereus is present in soil. So if you were to get some puncture wound into your foot or hand or some other part of your body, and there's some soil, we can get an introduction of bacteria from the soil into the wound. That's another way we can get infected with this bacteria. So if you were to get infected by eating contaminated food, as we mentioned before, many different foods can be contaminated with this, we get gastrointestinal symptoms. And the gastrointestinal symptoms can be further broken down into the emetic type, as I mentioned before, and also the diarrheal type. Those are the two types of infection we can get from Bacillus series infection. Whereas if we were to get a direct inoculation into a wound, for instance, so soil that contains the bacteria gets into the wound, we can get extra gastrointestinal symptoms. So symptoms outside of the gastrointestinal system. So we don't get gastrointestinal symptoms, we get other symptoms. We'll talk about those as we go through this lesson as well. So let's talk about the gastrointestinal manifestations. We talked about the fact that there are two types of gastrointestinal illnesses from Bacillus series infections. One of them is the emetic type. And the emetic type is going to affect the upper gastrointestinal tract. So it's mostly going to affect the stomach and the first part of the small intestine, the duodenum. Now the emetic type is going to be due to a preformed toxin known as cerealide. So very important. It's going to be a toxin that's already been preformed. So it's going to be something that's already in the food. It's not going to have to be formed within the body. And it's going to act to cause emesis or vomiting, nausea, vomiting, and some other symptoms we'll talk about later on. It's thought that this preformed toxin affects the central nervous system to cause vomiting, but the exact mechanism is not entirely known. Because it's preformed, it can have quick symptom onset within 30 minutes to six hours. So less than six hours, that's going to be what's going to be key with regards to the emetic type. Because the toxin is already preformed, it's going to be 
less than six hours, we're going to have signs and symptoms. And another thing with regards to this preformed toxin is that it is heat resistant. So regardless of how much you were to cook the food, even a very high temperature, the toxin doesn't get destroyed by the heat. So you can still have the toxin even with proper cooking. The second type is the diarrheal type. So this is going to affect the lower gastrointestinal tract. Now the symptoms in the diarrheal type are going to occur a little later. The symptom onset is generally going to be within 6 to 18 hours. So in general, we're going to state that it'll be greater than six hours. The symptom onset in the diarrheal type is going to be greater than six hours after ingestion of the contaminated food. The reason that this is the case is that the diarrheal type is due to ingestion of cells that produce and secrete enterotoxins. So instead of us ingesting the preformed toxin already, we actually ingest the cells that take time to produce the enterotoxins. So they get into the gastrointestinal system and then produce enterotoxins. That's why it takes longer to see symptoms, 6 to 18 hours in general. Now there are actually several different enterotoxins and they can have different mechanisms of action. Some can activate adenylate cyclase to increase cyclic AMP and lead to a watery diarrhea that way. Some can lead to other pathophysiological mechanisms. For instance, one is the non-hemolytic enterotoxin that activates nod-like receptor protein 3. So those are a couple of examples of some of the mechanisms as to how these enterotoxins work. But suffice to say, they will lead to diarrhea and a lot of it. We'll talk about that here in a moment. So with regards to the emetic type, we're going to have nausea and vomiting, and we may have diarrhea and cramping or abdominal pain as well. So particularly with regards to food poisoning, if there is vomiting involved, bacillus serious infections are going to be something to think about. So in the case of other food poisonings, there may be diarrhea that's going to be very common. But if we see nausea and vomiting with the food poisoning, we have to think about some particular infections. One of them here is bacillus cereus. We can think about norovirus as well. But again, that's something to think about when we see nausea and vomiting from a food poisoning. And there have been some rare complications in patients who have had the emetic type. These complications include hepatic failure and even mortality, although these complications are extremely rare. And signs and symptoms in the diarrheal type include watery diarrhea. It's going to be profuse, so a lot of watery diarrhea. And it's not going to be bloody, non-bloody watery diarrhea. That's going to be what we see in the diarrheal type of bacillus series infections. You can also see abdominal cramps, and we may have nausea with this type of infection as well. Now, there are extra intestinal manifestations that can occur. These are going to mostly occur in penetrating wounds or traumas that have the introduction of the bacillus series bacteria into the wound. These include endophthalmitis. So endophthalmitis can lead to something that looks like this. This is actually the most common extraintestinal manifestation of a bacillus series infection. So this is often going to be due to some trauma or penetrating wound into the eye. So it's an introduction of the bacillus series bacteria into the eye. And with this, we can also see vision loss as well. And again, this is often going to be from an ocular penetration injury. In other cases, if you were to have some wound that has bacillus series in the wound, this can cause fever, fatigue, and malaise, so a general feeling of being unwell. It has also been reported that respiratory infections can occur that are similar to anthrax-related disease. In some more severe cases, we may see bacteremia and septicemia and endocarditis, so an inflammation and infection of the endocardium of the heart. And this is often going to be from IV drug use in central venous catheters. And some other symptoms of a bacillus series infection include keratitis and tissue bone infections. Now, the risk factors for serious complications are going to be immunocompromised, so patients who have diabetes or, or who are HIV positive or who have AIDS, and those who are using IV drug use. So those are going to increase your risk for having some of these more rare and severe complications of an infection with this bacteria. Now, how do clinicians diagnose a bacillus series infection? Oftentimes, it's going to be a clinical diagnosis. So a patient reports that they've eaten reheated rice and they have nausea and vomiting. That's often going to be enough to make the diagnosis. But some other ways to diagnose this include isolating the serotypes of the bacteria in food or excreted from the patient. So if we're actually to get a sample of the food and isolate bacillus series in the food, that's enough to make the diagnosis as well. Body fluid analysis for extraintestinal disease, so actually testing and isolating for the bacteria in body fluids 
in the extraintestinal disease? And once a clinician has made the diagnosis, how do they treat it? This is often going to be supportive. Treatment's going to include symptom control, oral hydration. If they're losing lots of fluids from excessive diarrhea, it's important to stay hydrated, replete, and replenish their electrolytes as well. If they're having issues with severe infection and they're not able to keep anything down, they may need IV support. And the reason that this is supportive is because symptoms resolve spontaneously within 24 hours of symptom onset. And with regards to the emetic type, this resolution may be even sooner, maybe within nine hours. In cases where there are severe complications, some of those we talked about before, especially endophthalmitis, or some of those including bacteremia and septicemia, we require antibiotics. These include vancomycin, gentamicin, and carbapenems. So these are the ones that we're going to need to use because Bacillus series is resistant to other antibiotics. For another important cause of watery diarrhea, please check out my lesson on Clostridium difficile. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.